Hi everyone, welcome back to The Physical Educator. Today we're going to talk about information processing as part of topic 5, skill in sport. And we're going to start as we usually do by looking at the assessment objectives so you know what it is you're being asked to do throughout this unit. A very detailed unit this one, as you can see there's only one objective one, meaning that 13 out of the 14 specification points require you to go into as much detail as you possibly can about information processing in all of its forms. So let's get stuck straight into it. Firstly, we need to look at a simple model for information processing, and that's 5.2.1. Okay, I'm gonna keep this simple because throughout this whole unit, we build upon 5.2.1 and 5.2.2, and each point thereafter, builds upon this knowledge. So we're gonna start with a very simple model for information processing. And it starts with input. And input can come in a variety of ways. It can be using your senses. And I'll leave it there for now because we'll go into this in more detail shortly. Your senses provide an input. That input goes to your central nervous system, to your brain, where a decision is made based upon the information the input has provided. The decision is made and then it's sent back down your neurons to your muscles to initiate contraction and you have an output or a movement and that is a simple model of information processing so the one thing to take from this is the exam question that you get asked if the exam question is asking for a simple model then this is what you think about if it asks for something a bit more detailed then you're more than likely going to be talking about 5.2.2 in the Welford's model we're going to take this one step further now and look at Welford's model for information processing. Again, when looking at Welford's model for information processing, I'm only going to touch on it and describe each section because the specification points thereafter go into each one in more detail. So we're going to start off with the sense organs and internal sensors. So we've already identified in the simple model about input. This is looking at that input a little bit more. So we have sense organs which we've identified, touch, smell, taste, etc. Internal sensors are our receptors inside our body, and we've looked at some of them during unit two, chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. There's also proprioceptors. We've looked at a little bit of that with the muscular system, but they're very important here within this section. Once our sense organs and our internal sensors have detected a change or a movement, this needs to be perceived. And the way this is perceived is within the central nervous system and it's the relationship between this perception and memory. So initially something goes into your short-term memory and think about when you do something for the first time. When you do something for the first time, it's very different to if you do something for the 15th time because you are in this memory cycle of remembering how to perceive the information that's being provided to you. So when the information goes into the short-term memory, there is a decision made. This decision can either progress into the effector stage or it can go into long-term memory and long-term memory in a loop can come back and affect the perception and how you perceive the stimulus that's presented in front of you. And finally, we look at the effectors, which is pretty much the output and what movement is being affected by this decision based upon this stimulus. And this is Welford's simple model of information processing. It might be easy for you to separate this into three sections. Firstly, the detection, which is the sense organs and the internal sensors. Secondly, it's perception, short-term memory, decision-making and long-term memory in this memory cycle, this perception memory cycle. And then finally, we have the effectors. Now, also with the effectors, what's important for us to remember is that the effector control and the effector can also go back to perception. And that, le that leads us to understand and appreciate how to respond appropriately based on doing something over time and repetitively. Hence the reason we practice things to become better, because we strengthen this memory trace and we make our output better based on the stimulus that we're presented with. 5.2.3 wants us to look at the components associated with sensory input. So in the simple model, this is input. In Welford's model, this is sense organs and internal sensors. 
we have two different types of receptors that we need to learn within this unit. We have exterior receptors and interior receptors. And if you look at the two words, exterior and interior, it's pretty obvious how they work. Exterior receptors, they detect information from outside of the body. So there are sense organs, our sight, our smell, our touch, our taste, etc. They're sense organs detecting things from outside the body. The interoceptors detect information from within the body. So barrel receptors indicating change in blood pressure, chemoreceptors, the temperature and the, the acidity of the blood, proprioceptors, movement at the joints. And proprioceptors is one we're going to look at a little bit further now. With our proprioceptors, they detect and inform the central nervous system of body position and limb movements. And that is the difference between exteroceptors and interoceptors. Now we've looked at sensory input, we need to look at the signal detection process. And that's 5.2.4. So signal detection pretty much means perception. And we've already looked at perception. That's how we perceive the input that's provided. So this is the middle of the simple information processing model where the decision making is. It's the second box along the perception box for the Welford's model, touching on some of the short-term memory too. So signal detection is the process where the brain makes sense of the stimulus that's received. So we've discussed that already. Short-term memory can store large amounts of information for a very short time. Therefore, we need selective attention to look out for what's important within the stimulus. For example, if I'm playing in a stadium, I don't need to be looking at what colour t-shirt the fans have in the crowd or what noise they're making. I need to focus on the game. And if I'm performing optimally and I've got the ability to really narrow my focus, my selective attention can help me identify the stimulus that I need. Selected stimuli is then compared to long-term memory to select appropriate responses. So again, going back into that stadium, someone's much more nervous on their first performance in front of this crowd than they would be on their hundredth because they're used to, and in their long-term memory, they're used to this performance with that crowd, with the noises, with all the different clothes that they're wearing, with the different colours, with things that are going on in the crowd. They're used to zoning out on that to focus completely on their sport in hand. This can be referred to as the detection, comparison, recognition process. So we detect things, we compare to previous outings and previous exposure to these stimuli. We recognize with what's important for our skill, and that's the process of detection, comparison, recognition, and how that can affect our performance. 5.2.5 is looking at the difference between short-term sensory store, short-term memory, and long-term memory. I'm already about short-term memory and the store that it has. So I'm gonna go through these in order. We're gonna start with short-term sensory store. It is unlimited in its capacity. So for the first 0.5 seconds, you will detect vast amounts of information from the stimulus around you, vast amounts. However, it only stores for 0.5 seconds. So if I was to ask you tomorrow about a particular time of the day, I'd ask you about everything that you detected and sensed, you wouldn't have a memory of it all because lots of information comes into our mind and straight out. And that's within the short-term sensory store. However, what hits the short-term memory are the repetitive elements to the stimulus. And the short-term memory can hold up to 10 pieces of information for 10 seconds. And that's why selective attention is very important here because it can sieve through the stimuli and pick out the important aspects that are required. And it can hold it for 10 seconds. Again, through practice and through exposure, these elements to short-term memory can end up in long-term memory when practice, practice, practice. Just like you practicing for your IB sports science exams. Practice, practice, practice. It shifts information from short-term memory to long-term memory. Whether it's revision for a test or whether it's a skill that you're practicing, it's the same shuffle between the memory stores that happens. And on your long-term memory, it's unlimited storage and a lifetime of storage. Obviously, things need to be repeated because things can be lost out of long-term memory. Some fun homework to do with this. There's a fantastic Disney Pixar film called Inside Out. 
And it really has an insight into memory and the way that the film portrays memory traces and how it can end up in long-term memory and in storage, etc. It's not directly linked, but it's a nice little watch for you to appreciate and understand the way the brain works. So check that out if you've not seen it already. Just to summarize, we sense information, it goes to the short-term memory. We practice, we practice, we practice, rehearse, 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 it goes into long-term memory and we begin to consolidate this memory trace as it gets stored in long-term memory. Next, we need to discuss the relationship between selective attention and memory. Selective attention operates in the short-term sensory store. Only the relevant information is passed to short-term memory where it's held for several seconds. Now, this is important, and as we've just discussed, short-term sensory store detects everything, but it's only what's important that gets passed to the short-term memory. So it's important to remember that. The information that is provided to the short-term memory can be determined through previous experience and information that's in the long-term memory. And that, once again, selectively chooses what's important from the stimulus for us to embed that strong memory trace. This experience allows for selective attention to filter out a relevant noise. Now, it doesn't just mean noise. Within this, noise is information stimulus. So if you blank out that noise, you can focus on what's important, which is the task at hand. Selective attention is very important in fast pace activities where immense focus is vital. The more practice, the stronger the bond with long-term memory. Whereas memory allows us to benefit from past experience. If we didn't have this past experience, everything that we would approach would be almost like doing it for the first time. All incoming information is held in the short-term sensory store and lost within half a second, no memory. Incoming information is only retained and processed if it's attained in the short-term memory. So therefore, most of the information is lost within 10 seconds within the short-term memory. It's only what's important and repeated that is retained and consolidated within long-term memory. And this is completely dependent on rehearsal in both physical and mental capacity. Short-term memory is limited storage. This is overcome by selective attention, filtering out noise, whilst long-term memory has unlimited storage for the consolidated memory. And that's the difference between selective attention and memory. 5.2.7 wants us to compare different methods of memory improvement. So these eight different types of memory improvement that we need to know during this unit. And I'm gonna use golf as the example through each of these eight examples. And we're gonna start with association. So when you use association to improve memory, you are linking new information with information that the learner already knows, even if it's from a different context to the new information. If I was teaching to drive, and how different driving is in golf to using an iron. I might draw on the experience of the performers, softball, baseball, or rounders, if you're from an English background, and that technique at school, and associate that to how it feels when you hit a driver compared to when you hit an iron. And it's more of a baseball style swing, even though obviously your body's in a different position, but that's the feel that you try to get with the driver. And by using that association, I can tap into the, the previous experience the performer has of that body movement around the torso, and I can then relate it to the golf drive itself. And that's association. You're associating the new skill with the performer's previous experience. We then move on to brevity. Now, brevity means giving a learner a small amount of information at one time to avoid overload. I've listed things to think about, and there's more than this, when practicing your golf swing. So you've come to me as a performer, I'm your coach, and I'm gonna say, okay, so this is what we're gonna work on today. Correct grip, so I explain four or five teaching points for your grip, then your stance, then your takeaway, then your rotation, your backswing, then your downswing, make sure you transfer your weight through impact, follow through, okay? If you got all that, off you go. Obviously, it's too much information, so you would break that down. You would consider brevity in your approach. 
With that in mind, the approach would be, okay, for the next 35 minutes, we're just gonna focus on your grip. Forget every other aspect of the swing, we're just gonna focus on your grip. And when we feel like the grip's mastered and we're happy with that, we can then move on to the next bit of small information and we slowly build up the complete golf swing. And this is considering brevity. Next, we've got something called chunking. Chunking is where the information is taught in small bundles. It's got more chance of transferring to long-term memory than if it's taught in its entirety. So similar to brevity, but we chunk small things together. Now I've already done this. When considering brevity and I said, just focus on grip. Well, grip has a number of things and that is chunked together in just that one word of grip. But there's a few things to consider. Just like if I was to say your stance there's a few things to consider and we're chunking that together. You've then got your takeaway, which is your initial part of your backswing, rotation of your hip at the top of your backswing and your shoulders. And again, we can even chunk them three things together and call that the backswing. So there's a number of chunked examples there within this example. Moving on from chunking, we have clarity. Now clarity is important to consider when coaching because you, you need to try and avoid teaching two similar but distinct items in the same session as the memory might overlap with the other and lead to confusion and lack of progress. So again, the obvious example here is a driver and an iron. If you came to me and said you wanted to sort your swing out, we wouldn't be spending 20 minutes on the driver, 20 minutes on your irons and then going back to your driver. Because although parts of your golf swing are the same, you have a different approach to the way you approach the ball, the way you stand over the ball, what you do with your body. It's different between these two types of club. So therefore we wouldn't focus on them together. We'd have clarity and we'd have a session or two on the driver, session or two on the iron, if not more, but we'd do it in separate manners. Next we have coding. Now with coding, we've done this with every example because it, coding simply is naming or giving labels to information. Well, you do that in golf. And these are some of the codes that I've mentioned already and that you would use with a swing. You've got grip, stance, takeaway, backswing, downswing, transfer weight, follow through and connectedness. There's many more. There's just some examples for you of codes that are given to sets of information, sets of teaching points. So you can, if I was your coach, say grip was a bit off there or your stance was a bit wrong with that club or your takeaway wasn't quite right, then you could draw on that information straight away because you've been taught it in a code, in a, in a name. So therefore learning can be quicker because of this and less confusing because there's less teaching points to remember. Organisation is quite simple. You're providing the information in an order, allowing for meaningful learning. So it's organised learning, it's not just made up. So again, we've got all of these terms that we've used, putting them in an order. We've got grip, stance, connectedness, takeaway, backswing, downswing, transfer weight, follow through. And again, there's other things to consider, but that's the order from the start of the swing to the end of the swing of what you would need to be considering. Next, we have practice. Practice, practice, practice. Repeat the information over and over, and this creates a memory trace, which is repeated shuffle between short-term memory and long-term memory. And the more we can shuttle the information between STM and LTM, the more it will embed and consolidate and become a long-term memory. And lastly, we have rehearsal, which is processed and prepared either mentally and or physically. So with golf, there's obviously a lot of physical preparation. You can do that at the driving range. You can even do it with a practice swing just before to get the feel of the club right, the feel of your stance, the grip, etc. Whatever it is that you're focusing on, you can really rehearse that either in a practice session or out on the course with a practice swing before you're about to play your shot. You can also use simulators to rehearse when you can't access the course or, or you want to have a bit more information by the technology that comes with a simulator about the, the flight angle or the speed of release, etc. Or lastly, mental rehearsal, huge in the game of golf. You stand over the ball and you look where you want to play the shot and you, vi you have a vision of success. You have a vision of doing the things correct. You don't have the negative rehearsal of I'm gonna hit the trees, I'm gonna hit the sand, I'm gonna hit the water. If you focus on where it's gonna land and how you want the shot to look, you're more likely to be able to replicate that thereafter. 
And these are the eight different types of memory improvement that we need to learn. And what's valid for you to do now is to put this into your sport. Think of examples for each of the eight memory improvement techniques for your sport, write them down on a piece of paper and use that within your revision. Five point two point eight wants us to define the term response time. Now response time is the reaction time to a stimulus plus the complete response movement. So to summarize, if let's say a multiple choice question, reaction time plus movement time equals response time. And it's that complete movement in response to you reacting to the stimulus. Next, we need to outline factors that determine response time. So now we've looked at what response time is, we need to look at factors that can affect it. So response time is an ability, meaning it has group variance. So it decreases as we age, as most things do, so we don't respond as quick. And males respond faster than females. So with that said, reaction time includes stimulus transmission, detection of stimulus, recognition of stimulus, decision to respond, nerve transmission time, and initiation of action. In layman's terms, reaction time includes a stimulus, so something happening to make you respond, detecting of said thing making you respond, recognition of that within your body and the, the time it takes to respond, nerve transmission from brain to wherever the body needs to respond, and then the initiation of that action from that part of the body. Hicks law refers to the reaction response time and how it increases as the number of alternative actions increase. So let's look at sprinting as an example here. Usain Bolt, all right, he's the fastest man ever, but he doesn't have the best reaction time ever. Mainly probably because he was so fast, he could afford to sit in the blocks a little bit more and wait for others to respond first and then get ahead of them. So we don't actually know if his response time is, is worse than other performers. It maybe was a tactic that he used to make sure he didn't get disqualified. But with that said, let's look at the 100 meter sprint. Usain Bolt reacts, and this is his best reaction time, one tenth of a second. But what happens if alternative actions were possible at the start of the 100 meter race? Consider this. So as he, st as he stands on the, on the blocks, he's waiting for the gun to go off. But if he hears a hooter instead of a gun, that means he's got to turn around and run the other way. So now he's got options. So not only is he responding, but he needs to respond to the sound. Was it a gun, was it a hooter? If it's a gun, I run forwards. If it's a hooter, I run backwards. Would he respond within one tenth of a second, the same as this? Or would his response time be a little bit longer as he processes that information? Of course it would. It would take longer to respond to this change in information. Just like if when the gun goes off, he had to respond to a color in front of him and then that, and that color did, determined which way you ran, which direction you ran him. The more options available to the performer, the slower the reaction time is going to be. Now that's not a real example, that's a made up one for the concept of, of this conversation. But you can think about it yourself within different sports, these factors that can determine how fast you respond to situations. Be it in real time, be it a penalty, be it at the start of a race, whatever it may be, there's factors that determine the response time. And the more factors available, the slower your response will be. And that's what Hicks Law suggests. Next, we need to explore a difficult sounding concept that is something very easy that you've been doing for a long time without having a title to it. And that is the psychological refractory period, PRP. So the PRP, like I've just said, is something that we've done for years without realizing it. So I've put a football picture on here as an example. Um, and it could be any invasion game really, but when you approach a defender and you might drop your shoulder and run the other way with the ball, that drop of the shoulder is the dummy. In basketball, it might be a jab step or it might be a fake. Whatever you do, it's a decoy to make the defender move so you explode in the other direction. And what PRP suggests is that when two stimuli presented close together, the reaction time for the second stimulus is slower than normal. 
So if I was just to run past you on the right-hand side with a football at my feet, you'd be able to stay alongside me. If I drop my shoulder to the left and then go to the right, you're still responding to my drop of the shoulder. And you have to complete that action before you can complete the second action of catching up with me. So if we, if we do detect a stimulus, the processing of the information is slower whilst the second stimulus is presented. So you're unable to process the second stimuli until the primary stimuli is processed. And this is called a single channel mechanism. Subsequently, our reaction time is lengthened for the second stimulus to account for this. This increase is referred to as the PRP. So again, football, you drop your shoulder, you go the other direction. Look at, if you want to be in real time, look at Bruno Fernandez's penalty at the moment for Manchester United. He jumps and lands just before he kicks and he's not missed. He's got one of the best records for scoring penalties in Europe. I think it's 27 out of 29 penalties he's scored. And partly because of this technique, it's so unique. He jumps, so the goalkeeper has to respond to this strange jump just before he kicks. So he's still responding to that and then as he lands, he kicks the ball. Whereas if he was just to run up and kick the ball normally, the goalkeeper would only be responding to that one stimulus. Think about basketball, ball gets fired out to James Harden, about to score a three-point shot. Fake shoots, the defender jumps, he can then step to the side and take his shot. The defender is still responding to the fake. So as he jumps to block it, James Harden can move on to his second move, which is to move to one side and take the shot. Whereas the defender still has to finish responding to the stimulus of the fake shot before they can try and block the second shot, the actual shot. And this is referred to as the PRP. Throwing in a dummy in a lot of team games is, is this example. Tennis, if you go to play a ground stroke from the baseline and you throw a little drop shot in there, the, the opposing player will still be responding to the big backswing as if you're gonna play a, a forceful ground stroke, then they can respond and go to the net. If you telegraph it and make it obvious you're gonna play a drop shot at the net, the, the, the opponent only has one stimulus to respond to and probably can get to the ball in time. 5.2.11 wants us to describe a motor program. So a motor program is built up by things called subroutines. And subroutines are mini parts of the complete technique. So I'm gonna use sprinting as a quick example. I've already used golf, which for my head would be an obvious example to use here because it's many little things that build up the, the complete performance. But this is, this is evident in every sport and it's less obvious to a sport if you're untrained in it. So sprinting, you just assume, oh, he's only running as fast as he can, or she's only running as fast as she can. But there's many, many more aspects to it. You've got the start out the blocks. You've, you've got the actual response time to start with. Then you've got how you respond to that and coming out as a straight line, bursting out of the blocks. Then you've got your initial drive phase. Then you've got the middle phase of the race where you're trying to prolong your optimal speed and yet then you've got the finish where you're trying to remain that with that technique as fast as you can if you speak to a sprinter there's more ways of breaking down a sprint than what i've just suggested but they're the basic ways and these are all subroutines that can be practiced in separation and when you put all these subroutines together you get the executive program which is the full technique or the full skill being performed again like I've said with some other aspects of this unit, I've given sprinting as an example, basketball and football as an example for PRP, given golf as an example for the memory improvement. Apply your own sporting example to these and you'll understand it in much more detail. Next, we need to motor from both open and closed loop perspectives. Motor programs from an open loop perspective so I've put this in a bullet point form for you. It's good for your research and your revision for your exams. So a memory trace is created between short-term memory and long-term memory, meaning it's shuttling between the two. With practice, this skill can become autonomous and subconscious. The subroutines are structured in a hierarchical way, and this creates the executive program. Once the skill is learned, it can be executed without feedback being used to control the movement. Examples of an open loop perspective are non-stable, unpredictable environments where an object is in motion, which dictates the start point for the skill. So it's open loop. 
We don't know when it's going to start, but by practicing and practicing and practicing. So again, basketball, you watch the, the guys on the TV, they shoot thousands of shots in practice from different scenarios. The same in any team game, really. A net game, the same. You can practice a ground stroke as many times as you want, but you don't know how you're going to be standing, what part of the court that you're going to be on playing that stroke. It's dependent on the game. But the more you practice, the more you can subconsciously react to that scenario around you. And that is an open loop perspective. Closed loop perspective, structured in the same way as open loop. However, feedback can be used to correct the outcome of the skill. Kinesthetic and internal feedback is used. So how it feels from within your body can be used as feedback for the next time you play that shot. Closed loop movement is more effective with skills requiring slow limb movement or movements taking place over a longer period of time. Short term memory compares with long term memory if there is a match. And if there is, then we can continue with that skill. If there's a mismatch, then the movement can be corrected. Examples of closed skill examples performed in a stationary environment, such as hitting a golf ball, shooting a bow in archery, playing snooker or billiards or pool, things with a stationary object, even a conversion in uh, rugby or in American football could be used here for an example. Closed skill, your previous movement can dictate and provide some feedback for how you can change that and that is a closed loop perspective. So it's very similar here when we look about open and closed skills. Think about them sorts of skills within the open and closed loop. 5.2.13 wants us to outline the role of feedback in the information processing models. So again, there's many types of feedback that can be given. Intrinsic feedback comes from within the performer. So it's a feeling. Again, golf is an obvious example here. You know, without even seeing the ball, you can feel if it's come off the club well, you can you feel it in your hands, you can feel it in your body. You know if you've made a mistake or you know if you've nailed it straight away. Same with cricket, same with a lot of sports really. You can get, the more you play something, the more you develop an intrinsic appreciation for how good technique feels. And that's what intrinsic feedback suggests. Extrinsic feedback is provided to the performer. It's information provided on how to improve, which is key as it can be from a spectator or from a coach. And a lot of time, you won't even know what to do or what you've done wrong or, or what you've done right and you might need that information provided to you by said coach or, or spectator and that can help you to make your improvements in your amendments. Knowledge of results. This is when the outcome of the skill is known and the outcome of the skill is apparent. So the decision is made based upon an outcome. So if you know the results, I'm going to use cricket as an example here. You see people bowling in the nets in cricket practicing. They're never gonna practice bowling in the nets without the three wickets at the end. Or even, in most cases, even a batsman stood there. They're not just gonna aimlessly bowl into a net with no wicket there, because they won't have that outcome. They won't know if they've got the length right, if the ball's bouncing up right, if they're accurate enough to hit the wickets. It's just like a penalty. You wouldn't practice a penalty in football without a goalkeeper in the goal because you don't know if it's going to go in. You know, you wouldn't practice free kicks from 20 yards out without a wall. So you're just shooting at the goal. You need to prepare the practice with the outcome there so you can see it and you can get feedback from the outcome. So if I'm practicing a free kick in football, which is kicking the ball in the goal from, let's say, 25 yards out, and there's a wall 10 yards away of defenders, I'm not going to practice without a goalkeeper and without a wall. Pointless, because I don't know if I'm getting the right height, the right bend, if it's going over fast enough so the goalkeeper can get across and save it. I need all of the correct components in there so I can get feedback from the outcome and you know from the result of that skill. And that's using the knowledge of results to provide feedback during a performance. Knowledge of performance. The outcome of the skill is not apparent, but knowledge of how to perform the skill is drawn upon. So this might be dribbling with a football in a closed area just to de develop your ability to dribble with the ball, develop your skill level with that ball at your feet. You might not have a defender in front of you, so there's no outcome is known, but you're improving your skill. Again, golf at a driving range, just aimlessly hitting balls into the wilderness can improve your hand-eye coordination and your feel. So you, what you can do with the knowledge of performance is you can really develop that intrinsic feedback 
the more you practice, the more you become aware of your body. So you might not have the outcome yet. You might not have that in front of you, but you're developing an intrinsic appreciation for how that skill should feel. And that's using knowledge of performance, not knowledge of results. Positive feedback is praise and reinforcement. It reassures you, boosts confidence of the performer. Um, very important, but it does depend on the type of performer that is being coached. Some people respond really well to positive feedback, some people don't. Some people find it patronising or they don't respond to it at all. You also have negative feedback. Again, depends on the type of performer. It's easy to suggest that negative feedback should never be given, but the truth is some people thrive on it. It focuses on negative aspects of the performance. It can motivate, however, it can demotivate performer. A quick example of this and the psychology used within elite sport, Sir Alex Ferguson, one of the greatest football managers ever, managing Manchester United. Wayne Rooney, one of the best footballers ever, has told this story a few times. Wayne Rooney's been in the changing rooms with uh, Nani, who was a player at the time, who wasn't mentally as strong as Rooney and made a few mistakes. And Sir Alex Ferguson would use negative feedback directed at Wayne Rooney at half time, saying, stop dribbling with the ball, stop doing this, stop doing that. And the truth is Wayne Rooney wasn't doing these things, but Wayne Rooney responded very well to negative feedback. So it would upset him, it would annoy him, it would spur him on to go out in the second half and perform better. But really what Sir Alex Ferguson was doing was talking to Nani through Wayne Rooney. So Nani was sat there thinking, oh, if he's coming after Wayne and saying these things, then he must be talking about me as well. So although it's negative feedback, it wasn't provided to Nani directly in a negative way because his shoulders would have slumped and he wouldn't have performed as well. So that's a clever use of negative feedback because the manager knew the performers. So the message here that I'm saying is positive and negative feedback can both be used. It's completely dependent on the performer and you need to get to know your performer as to whether it's going to motivate them or demotivate them. Concurrent feedback means feedback that can be used in game time and it can be altered in game time. So proprioceptory kinesthetic information pro provides in-game feedback. So a performer can get instant feedback from a bad tennis shot, from a bad golf shot, from a bad pass and then they can correct it in, in the game itself. It can be provided to them if the coach in that sport has an opportunity to give them that feedback during the match. But ultimately, concurrent feedback means the skill can be altered during the performance. Whereas terminal feedback, and we've used this word terminal a few times in sports science already, terminal is at the end. You know, when you fly somewhere, you go to the end. You fly from end to end, so it's a terminal. That's what it's called at the airport. It's the same thing here. Terminal feedback, is pro terminal feedback is provided after the performance is finished and it can be provided immediately after or after a cooling period where the, the performers had a chance to settle down before they're given that feedback. But ultimately, it doesn't change that performance. It's something to be thought of for the next performance. And lastly, 5.2.14, outline the role of feedback in the learning process. And lastly, there's types of feedback that can affect the learning process itself. And reinforcement of learning is one of them. If you reinforce correct technique, you reinforce correct skill performance. This will encourage a repeat of this in performance. So this can be used as an extrinsic motivator, positive, concurrent or terminal. But this reinforcement of learning helps to embed that memory trace between short-term memory and long-term memory. Motivation, again, it's dependent on the personality of the performer, can work for or against the coach depending on how it is used and who it is used with. It can be impacted by all eight examples that we spoke about in the previous section. And it's completely dependent on the relationship between the coach and the performer as to whether or not it will be successful to motivate them. We also have adaptation of performance. So the more variety of feedbacks used, the greater chance of performance adaptation. If you just offer positive feedback, then when things go wrong, how do we fix that? If you just offer positive feedback, the performer can get very complacent with it saying, oh, he's saying well done to me again. 
So you mix it up. You could throw in some negative feedback as well as some positive feedback. You could offer no feedback and allow the performer to use intrinsic feedback. You can allow intrinsic feedback to start off with and then give them some extrinsic feedback. So the more variety, the more chance of an improvement that will take place to that performer. And lastly, punishment. This can be used to punish a performer after a performance. It can sometimes be used during, but it's not just to shout at them and get your anger out and, and go against them. Punishment can be used. And I gave it, um, an example before with Wayne Rooney and Nani, how punishment can be used in a positive manner. And it completely depends on the emotional intelligence of the coach in how to use this as an effective method. Sometimes it can be more simple and the punishment can give to, to give the performer a bit of a kick up the backside to tell them that they need to work harder. That's where a punishment could also be valid as well. Simply punishing people because they've made honest mistakes isn't going to work. If it's elite level, we're talking a completely different situation where things are punished because it's a lot of money's on the line. Um, and the way coaches speak to professional athletes is very different to how coaches speak to amateur athletes and how coaches speak to children. Something else to consider as well and how punishment can be used. Thanks for watching. If you're a teacher looking for teaching resources, don't forget to check out the Physical Educator TES channel and you can pick up resources there for all units, including a detailed PowerPoint on skill in sport.